Talk Show. It's the Daily Talk Show, episode 543. In the studio, we've got Fergus Watts. Welcome, buddy. Gents, honour. Thank you. Mate, uh, Appreciate it. Founder of the company that first gave me a uh, my first paycheck for freelance video really? work. Invoice 0001. Well, we're talking yesterday, Ferg, about um, when you start out in business, do you not lead with 0001 because they know it's the first job? You'd be a bit tricksy about it. Do you add so we like used to, uh, we used <laughs> to make sure that all of our proposals went out with like, you know, 5,492. So it looked like <laughs> yeah. there was some science behind them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I reckon I didn't mark it. I reckon it would have been 0001. I'll mm. tell you the quick story. So when I moved up to Sydney, um, I left radio and I was like wanting to get into video. I wasn't quite sure. And I'm sitting in a cafe looking probably lonely and your brother walks in, Jack, mm-hmm. and he says, oh, what's going on, mate? And we have a bit of a chat. And I told him that I was kind of looking to find some work. And he said, what are your skills? I love Jackie. He's a real straight shooter, just like you. He said, what are your skills? And I told him, video, blah, blah. He said, leave it with me. I got a call later that day. It's Gus Seaback from uh, from the yeah. Sydney office of Bastion. And he says, come in, mate. And then that's how I got my 0001 job <laughs> as there a freelance go. video guy. And so Bastion Collective, I feel like I know it as the business that's very good at buying businesses. It seems. We have done a bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're a marketing services group. So mm-hmm. we're a collection of marketing agencies. So we've got 10 agencies here in Australia. Uh, most of those we've we've acquired along the journey. Um, so we acquire small independent agencies and then we, when they all come together as a collective, then they can provide a fully integrated solution for clients mm. big and small mm. is, is the pitch. You were talking, uh, I heard on another podcast about the owner operator model and how you want to keep that within Bastion Collective. What are some of the challenges of having that type, I guess that personality, if you're used to running your own business, mm. how do they all play nicely? Well, that's, that is the million dollar question that, that, in our industry, in the marketing services industry, without going too deep, there's the very big and the very small, right? And there's a big gap in the middle. There's no one really in the middle. And and most of the time, the very small have started by people that worked at the very big, spat out, and they said, I don't want to deal with all of the big business stuff. I want to do my own thing. And after then a period of time, a small independent can only get to a certain size. And so then they say, well, what else is there? How do I get access to bigger clients? How can I grow the business and all that sort of stuff? And that's then when we come in. But the reality of that is that as m- much as we, you know, like to think that we're a lot less red tape and a lot less mm. politics and a lot less of the bullshit from a lot of the big companies, you're still not running your own shop down the road, mm. right, if mm. you're one of these entrepreneurs that's come into our group. So you've still got to work with our unified systems and, and some of that sort of stuff. So that's always that's always difficult and mm. it's always a challenge, but a big part of it is making sure that the people we bring in are people that recognise that and can adjust to that as they go. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's, that's a that's a huge component of not just making an acquisition based on the financial transaction but making an acquisition based on the people transaction and then running an organisation, you know, based on our three values. And the first one is make each other's lives better. Mm. And how, what? so I was going to say, how do you find great people? But it's using the values of the business to find the great people, is that? Yeah, I mean, it, finding great people more often than not is based on, um, is based on referrals, right? So the, the your example with mm. Jack, then Gus, that is how – business works is that I'm on a referral, you know, I recommend you because I like you, you're a good guy, mm. and then you come in with a, a warm introduction into whoever needs mm. your particular service. Oh, they not- regretted it because I was in the office in Sydney, <laughs> flat out, Jack, can I come in, mate? Can I get a ride with you? They do that with Tribe too. You're eating their Nando's chips. He's got a certain <laughs> certain way about it. What about Mr. 97? Can you can you get a gauge on, on whether he's a nice guy, whether yeah, he's a good guy? He looks nice. It's the <laughs> tips on top. It's sort of it's really the nice. on top. <laughs> Justin Timberlake. <laughs> got him on with the nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> and so what what are the blind spots that a lot of these owner operators have? Because I guess they, they come in and you get to see the friction points. Well... The blind spots in joining our group? Is that what you mean? Well, or generally like, in their like, running their business? Well, I guess if you're, um, if you're used to running your own shop, you can tell stories about who you are as a business and what you stand mm, for and yeah. what people are buying. 
versus when they come into a collective where they need shared values? What are some of the things that they're sort of the limiting stories? Okay, so so part of the part of the challenge generally is the autonomy, right? So when you're running your own show down the road, you can have full autonomy. Now the the stark reality, I mean the reality of business generally, without being too much of a doomsday, is that it's exceptionally difficult and very, very few people make any money out of starting their own company. Amen. And that is <laughs> <laughs> and that is um, very true in the service game. However, <clears throat> even if you're not making money, you're still running your own show. You're still living the, and breathing the day to day. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, the majority of people, especially in the service business, they they just love what they do. Right? Same as you guys. You mm-hmm. guys love doing this. People that make advertising or do PR or are research experts or create content. They love creating the content, right? Love crea- love executing mm-hmm. the craft and the skill. And even though they might be on their own with 10 people down the road in a, in a small office, they're still doing it for themselves and they're still creating the content. They're still doing all this stuff. When, uh, when you come into our place, we, we operate as a, as a business that needs to perform and perform consistently, right? And so that – removes a level of freedom there, right? Not that it's all about the numbers or any of that sort of stuff, but they are important because if one link in the chain starts to fall apart, that that has a flow and effect to mm. everyone else. So that autonomy does get lost a bit. Um, the other challenge is as a business grows, and this is a big reason why they choose to join us in the first place, is as uh, if you are exceptional at creating content or making advertising or whatever, you generally then build your company and you build it to a point where it has more staff, right? Now, every time you have more staff, you have tighter cash flow. When you have, mm-hmm. when you have more staff, you need a bigger office. And when you have a bigger office, you have more, more locked in payments every mm-hmm. month. So before you know it with 20 staff, you've got, you know, X hundred thousand dollars that you have to make every month just to break even to keep the thing alive. Then there's HR problems and there's issues about people complaining they don't have a car park. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes with that that is just the day-to-day mm. reality. Aren't of you in Cremorne business. too? Fucking Cremorne. <laughs> well, yeah. Car park's in Cremorne. I can imagine that being Except an issue. Exceptionally different. Well, there's sustainability business. They want everyone on the train getting in there <laughs> yeah, every yeah. day. So all of those factors come into come into it. So so what are the things that people find difficult? It, it's a difficult question to ask in isolation because it's about the entire journey of a business, right? So there's anyone sitting out there going, yeah, I want to start my own business. Starting your own business, the actual day one, it's not that difficult, yeah. right? It's day 265, then it's day 540. Then it, it, And the problems are the same problems. They're just mm. the bigger or they're slightly mm. evolved or they're, they're whatever they are. And that's the evolution of running a business, which ultimately gets you to a point where you think, I might want to sell this or I might want to join a, a group that does something bigger. So being a cop looks like a great idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, 10 weeks off different. Yeah. Join the academy <laughs> and then have a go. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then walk into a, you know, into a crack den that you have to then deal with all <laughs> yeah, the yeah, stuff no, that goes with that. that. Like th- that's that, and that's the reality that people don't see. Mm-hmm. And that's the reality of running a business. All looks great. Cool on the surface, and it is the majority of the time. It's great. I enjoy what I do. We all we all like what we do. But the the jur- the full journey of someone running a business and building their life, that's the story, mm. rather than an isolated piece of. It was a bit annoying that that happened. Mm. Or I didn't quite agree with this decision. Or, so, so the brands that you've acquired, you're looking to find people who are wanting to make the leap but can't do it within this specific. Model. We want, the- we want people that want to be able to build the business more than they can, mm-hmm. right? So in, in the marketing services world, if you want to go pitch on I don't know, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Nissan, Kia, these big brands, if you want to go pitch on that, there is just some reality around, around that. One, you have to be able to deliver the work at scale. That's a difficult thing to do in a, in a people business because if, if I engage you – if I engage you to do one video, you can do it with one person. If I engage you to 10 videos, you can do it. If I engage you to do 1,000 videos, mm-hmm. you can't do it, right? It's too, you, you need multiple staff and you need to scale up really quickly. I don't pay you for 90 days, so you've got to pay mm-hmm. five staff to deliver it for 90 days, which you can't cash flow. There's all that reality that goes with that. 
And that's that's just the truth of it. Then there's the reality that if if a brand of that note is going to um, pay, you know, whatever, a, a million dollars, whatever the number is, a big chunky number, to a to an agency to deliver a service, if that's an agency no one's ever heard of, it's a tough sell, mm-hmm. right? If it's if it's an agency that's been around for 50, 60, 70 years and is a global agency and everything else, well then it's a slightly it's easier. You're an sell. insurance policy essentially. There's a lot of that, right? So yeah. there's there's just a big reality mm-hmm. of all of those different options um, and, and those different variables that what we look for are people that say, I want to get access to a slightly bigger brand. I want to get access mm. to a place that has 400 clients going through it every year. Um, I want to get access to other services so I can provide an integrated solution to our clients. Um, and, you know, I want to be be part of something bigger. Half the time, it's I just want to have some peers, mm. you know. What about a health check? I guess you've looked at a lot of books uh, to work out which companies to buy. Mm. What are you looking at? I am a very, very basic operator when it comes mm-hmm. to that stuff. Um, I look at very basic money in, money out. Mm-hmm. Can they sell revenue, right? Can they sell enough clients to generate enough mm-hmm. revenue? Is that top line number good enough? Can they deliver that work in an acceptable margin? So if you sell a million bucks worth of advertising work and it costs you $1.1 million to deliver, who cares, mm-hmm. right? Like you, you just lost a hundred grand. And that, that happens a lot because in the creative industry, creative people who run that will say, well, it, it's all about the work. And it is all about the work until you can't pay the bills, yeah. right? And so- Well, it's not really a business at that point. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's going backwards. But yeah. that's what happens a lot of the time yeah. in the service business. So is there a discipline around that? And then that's it. Uh, and I, you know, I mean- What about debt? So if you go into a business and you're like, okay, they've got- Hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They've got this equipment and all that sort of thing. Yeah. How do you deal with that when you're acquiring a company? So that's part of part of the acquisition that comes mm-hmm. off the cost. Mm-hmm. Right, it comes off the acquisition price. That's g- pretty standard for generally how that works. The reality is most of the, the agency world doesn't have a uh, at that size yeah, yeah. doesn't have a heap of debt. Mm-hmm. It's people. Yeah. The people are the main cost. Yeah, salaries. Exactly. Like yeah. yeah, you don't have to go and invest in t- in in big equipment mm. or, I mean, mm-hmm. occasionally you do, but mm. it, but it, not often. What have you found in, you said there's sort of that old lay of the land of, the, you know, the big brands going with the bigger agencies that can service them. With the amount of people starting businesses these days, the easy bit starting, but there are a lot more boutique marketing or people using their personal brand to be able to connect with these bigger brands, maybe not to service them at that scale, but have you seen these bigger brands pulling in some of their money that they were spending at that scale game and now dispersing it to the individual creator. Yes. So, the, and th- that's, you know, I, oh, I have this conversation with people who are individual creators mm-hmm. a lot and and they they ask advice on building a business or, you know, how, how do you take it from what I do now to, you know, what you do. And I say, well, why do you want to do that? Mm-hmm. Because- you can make a lot of money as an individual creator because a lot of those times they, are, you know, you're highly talented people, right? Like highly talented people creating very good content um, that can go and execute the work really well. Now they can't do it at scale, but there are a lot more brands saying, well, you know, uh, th- this one particular person creates really good creative output for mm. us, does it in a niche area, that works right for us, right? And that, and that person, zero overheads, mm. you know, very little cost. Yeah, mum and dad's paying the rent. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> can, can control that sort of stuff. So there's a, there's a heap of benefit in that. And for anybody, you know, that, that's doing that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a purist and, and being passionate about mm. what you do and delivering your work because there's plenty of clients out there. Mm. What about freelancers working for agencies? What have you learnt about that? Oh, that's, they've stopped since me. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a big part of the industry. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a good part of the industry because ideation is a difficult thing. Coming mm-hmm. up with an idea that people are going to resonate with mm-hmm. that can ultimately sell a product, that is a difficult thing to do. Um, and it, it being, you know, with if you didn't have the freelance market, then agencies would only have the exact same people coming up with mm-hmm. ideas every time. Now, that can work to a certain extent, mm-hmm. but... Of course, you need some fresh ideas. Now, the 
beauty of our place is that we've got everyone in the in the one place, right? And we've got access to multiple different thinkers that come from multiple different disciplines that have you know that have different expertise, but all unify and work together. So we constantly engage different parts of the business to come mm. up with different ideas and different planning metrics and different execution um, as, as part of that. So that freshness, which is a big part of the freelance world, the freshness is we feel has been that issue has been solved by our collective of agencies mm. rather than just having one agency. Do, yeah. Doing the acquisition hire, the aqua hire type of model, do you end up with more dead wood because you're not in the hiring process or is there a certain way that these things sort of filter out over time? Uh, they do filter out over time, mm. yeah. Um, yeah. The, the biggest thing I've learned, it's nothing new. I was watching a thing last night, Richard Branson was saying the same thing. It's the same in business. Every time you think you're flying, you're not, yeah. right? And every Unless you've got you, an airline, you probably want to get that dialed <laughs> <laughs> But every t And every time you think you're going bad, mm. Something good happens, yeah, right? Yeah. So, like, just this business is just a constant flow up and down of mm -hmm. good and bad and <clears throat> multiple changes. And and we've been in this 10 years now. The good thing about being in 10 years is very few things that come up now that we haven't experienced, yeah. right? So we've experienced the good, the bad in every aspect of it. And now, like, as things come up, it's like it's not – shit, how do I deal with this? It's mm. like, oh, my God, is this happening again? Yeah. Like, you know, is that we, we've done this four times already, you know. And the, and I always um, say to mates of mine that run businesses and stuff like that, you know, it's like I can't believe we can't solve this one problem that's mm. come up four times. And they're like, mm. yeah, mate, it's four times in ten years. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, get over it. Like, <laughs> it's life. It happens, right? And that's that's just the truth of business. Um, when you so ten years ago you started, did you understand what the success actually looked like no. for you then, mate? I don't have a clue. I was twenty two <laughs> years old. I I I, I, let, I started this business um, after a very short and unsuccessful football career. Then got a, a job in an advertising agency for six or eight months. I, I kind of thought there is a way to partner with people who are experts in their field and then I could do whatever they didn't mm. want to do. That was basically- Were you a good the, employee? That was the premise. No, I was a te oh, no, no, no. I was, I was not Was that part of the reason of like, I can't be an employee, I need a partner? <laughs> it was a bit, yeah. Because I, I started, I was selling for this this advertising business and uh, and I was, you know, I was out there selling and, and then the, the guy would change, you know, my boss would, Change my job. Oh, we don't want you selling anymore. We want you doing this. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and he was like, I don't care. This is what's happening. And I was like, this is bullshit. Like, what? Yeah. And then, and that's kind of what kickstarted me into, into thinking, I've got to go do something by myself. Did he ever make you dye your hair? <laughs> Yeah, because no. we did make money. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's how that yeah, actually yeah. happened. Did. Surprisingly, yeah, he's not thinking about leaving. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> my host to run the Blonde tips of peroxide stuff. It's yeah. oh, I was a lot harder than that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, was, it was a full head. But it's that's just that's, it's been just six six that's been six months, has it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's done pretty well. How do you feel about it? I quite like it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you do? I'd like consider it. getting it done again. Yeah, really. Yeah. We got it done. You don't say that with a huge <laughs> amount of vigor. <laughs> <laughs> was, it was done uh, by Rachel Vitullo, who works at Joey Scandizo. It was uh, she's the number one colorist in Australia. Is that right? And so, like, in, we we should us around. <laughs> yeah, in good hands. <laughs> yeah, good. And so, um, looking at uh, employees and how they operate, and seeing the other side. So obviously, the frustration that you had there versus now being on the other side of the coin, running a business, what sort of empathy do you have for employees versus uh, business owners? Yeah, good question. It, it is, it's evolved over time is the honest answer. Um, when we have, we have sort of this blanket rule, like do whatever you want, just get the job done, mm. right? Which in theory is great. In reality – and, and over time, as our business has got bigger and, and we're in two countries now and all that sort of stuff, the, you know, part of me just like, just turn up, do your work, go home, right? Like there, there is the, the, on the, on the dark days, I go, geez, it'd just be easier if just everyone was a bit robotic and just yeah. turned up, did the job, went home. 
But then that sucks the life out of the place, right? Mm. And on the good days, it's like we want everyone to bring their absolute full self to life mm. uh, to work every day. And, and I, you know, I'd like <laughs> we have more good days than we have bad days. But um, that – and and that's – it's certainly changed over time. As a twenty-two-year-old coming out, I remember hiring our first employee. It was I, the, who was well, the I first didn't employee? Know a woman called Caroline McMillan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what great. was it? What was her role? Uh, she uh, she was a real like just. I, I think she was an account manager. I think was her title, but mm -hmm. she was a real mm -hmm. jack of all trades. She mm -hmm. used to just she used to keep the thing on the straight and narrow. Yeah. Would have been screwed with. So that. Was the first hire was an account manager. So who's servicing those? Like, so you got the account manager who's bringing in the work or doing all that, then would you get freelancers? Is that the idea at the start? Yeah, so we had um, – so this was uh, – the first employee was an was a advertising business mm -hmm. and uh, and the guy I partnered with was a very, very good high-end creative, creative guy and uh, and so he was the draw card for a lot of the work. He'd deliver a lot of the top-end creative and then a lot of the execution would then bring people in uh, over the journey to go and do that. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you need – you know uh, – uh, our business, any business, it is only as good as the people within it. And mm -hmm. and the people within it are only good if they believe in what you're doing and they believe that, you know, they they can grow themselves and achieve themselves. Mm -hmm. So it always gives me the shits when there's all this talk about, um, you know, millennials, you know, don't, they don't stick it out long enough, they don't do it. And now that's true, they don't. But why should they? You know, like <laughs> it's it, it, part of me, so we've got a – um, uh, we've got a, an average tenure. A average tenure pe people stay below thirty, stay kind of three years, which is fairly good. Above thirty, they stay a little bit longer. Generally, people with kids don't mm -hmm. chop and change as much. Um, you know, and our, our premise is well, you wouldn't want them staying more than five years, generally speaking. Right now, we have some that do, and they're terrific. And they and when they do, and they continue to evolve with the business. They're bang on, right? That's where you want lifers. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of the time you don't get that, but n nor should you. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's this thing about, you know, people, oh, people there's no loyalty anymore. There's, mm -hmm. you know, this loyalty is just, it's bullshit, yeah, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. what are they loyal to you for? Because you employed them and then paid them a wage yeah, and they yeah. delivered the work. Yeah. And especially in our industry, when people bust their ass, right? Like they yeah. really work. You get your pound of flesh out of them. And so this – Unless the company can continue to provide opportunities for mm. them to grow, earn more, develop a, a bigger life, why you know why why is that a terrible thing that they then leave mm. after a, after a three year period or whatever you know? And that, it, it, well, you've served their part of the uh, your part in their journey to do whatever they want, and, to do. and they've served their part in our journey, right? Mm. And that's the gig, and that's how it works. And and we find you know and that that's that's. That's a good part of mm. life, mm. right? Like, and it just, it's one of these things that just, you know, it's generally old blokes that talk about it and say, you know, there's, there's, they, they, they've got no values because they just chop and change their jobs and stuff mm. like that. It's like, mate, <laughs> join the real world. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, people are going to evolve and, and the reality is you can't keep paying staff more. You mm. just can't, right? You'd love to. You'd love to give people a pay rise every second year and you'd give them meaningful pay rises, but... You just can't in a business, so they have to go somewhere mm. else, and you know they shouldn't have to wait twenty years to be able to go and get the next evolution of their life. Yeah, I'm always really impressed when I see or hear about businesses that have formulated the business plan before they've even started. So yeah. um, Nick Stone from Bluestone Lane, he developed the business concept, mm -hmm. the idea. I think at business school was it when he was still a, while he, he was, was still doing the investment, the investment banking. banking and stuff. And it wasn't until it was really taking off that he's like, oh yeah. shit, I probably should. Well, there's two there's yeah. two different types. I yeah. mean, yeah, you guys are an interesting story yourself. So it's mm -hmm. it's interesting in the way you guys are doing it, but. It, I think there's two different types of operators. There's guys like Stoney, who I know from school days and footy days, very disciplined, mm. very intellectual, uh, great planner, great strategy guy. You know, he's, he's pretty hardcore Stoney in the way, in way he operates mm. in his discipline, right? And he's very successful and, he, and he's very good. And then, and I know a number of guys like that. Then there's guys like me and a number of guys like that just had none of that. Mm. You know, they just thought, shit, I'll just – do, I'll start something, mm -hmm. I'll sell something to someone and then I'll sell something else and then the thing will yeah, keep yeah. going. Was it a job at the start? Were you just creating a job for yourself at the start or did you always have the vision that it was going to be this bigger thing? Uh, yeah, do you know what? I don't know. 
I don't know if I can remember. Mm. <laughs> Is the honest answer. Like I think initially it was just I just want to go and do something for myself. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, th- I, I, I think I always thought. I think I always thought that we were going to. I was going to build a business. You mm. know. I, I mean, where does that come from? Is it from family? Is it reading books? Is it? Where? I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Is the honest answer. My my my, my old man. So I've been very lucky to work with my my old man and my brother for pretty much the entirety of Bastion. Um, my old man's been my mentor and taught me everything I know and, mm. and um, has been a great advisor to me over the journey. Jack, my brother, is the CEO of all of our Australian businesses, is an exceptional operator um, in, in, and we really complement each other very mm. well. Uh, he works he works on the on the clients. He deals with all the, the CEOs of our agencies. He runs the operations of the business. I look at our expansion, our growth, our future stuff. I mean, it's great to have a CEO that you can actually give a dead arm to <laughs> and not get arrested because <laughs> yeah, it's your bro. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and so so we've been very lucky in that. So I've learned a huge amount of those guys mm-hmm. and then also the um, the people that come into our business. Mm. Um, you know, they, these are experienced people, right, that are running their own business and much more experienced than I am, um, or certainly I was, and then, they, you know, I've learned a lot off them over the journey. So it's, it's been – I've been quite lucky in that regard. I've always had really good people around me, and then we've had great advisors. You know, we've had very high-profile advisors. Um, we've had great industry guys. We've had, we've had people around us that um, we can learn a lot from, um, which – has been vital, mm-hmm. you know, in our success. It seems like you've got a uh, comfortability with failure and pointing out your flaws. It was interesting. We, we were talking to uh, Nick Stone off air, talking about like, what does failure look like? He's like, failure is not an option, right? Like, mm-hmm. And it's very, it was like we were, was it Nick Rewalt that we were doing oh, yeah. stuff at Bond Street Dental? And I was like, oh, find a, uh, remember, we're trying to get him to smile. So I remember a happy moment before he's like, I was not happy or something. Yeah, like on, was, the ground, on the ground, on the ground, just fucking, you know, you're on it. And I was like, oh, there's something in this competitive uh, sportsmanship type of stuff that's pretty intense. Mm. Seems like you probably have a bit of a different perspective. I'm, uh, I'm very. I don't know if I'm okay with failure, but it is a big part of life. Yeah, and it's and and it's a big part of my life. There, in our kitchen, there is a uh, a quote um, by JFK that says uh, that that says you know only those who um, fail greatly can ever achieve greatly, right? And then there's another great quote by. Winston Churchill that says success is the ability to move from failure to failure with any uh, any loss of enthusiasm, mm-hmm. you know, and that that is so true. Now, mm-hmm. I, I think I was exceptionally lucky because I was a first round draft pick out of school. I was meant to be a bloody very good centre forward. I had a whole bunch of injuries. I was too slow, and my football career failed miserably. And it failed on a very public stage, right? So in Adelaide, I, you know. There was a reasonable profile around me in Adelaide and and people really let me know about how much I'd let them down and the supporters down and the mm. club down. You know, as I'm walking down the street in Adelaide or as I'm playing in the Santa grand final with 40,000 people, I knew all about it. State of South Australia, not happy with me. <laughs> Imagine, there was no, it wasn't state. social media as heavy as it is no, now. No, Imagine no. that. Oh, that yeah, had to go disaster. out on the street. Well, look at Jack Watts. He's, you know, getting thumped. Yeah, he's not your brother, media, not your brother yeah, yeah, yeah. the footy player. Yeah, <laughs> same talk, name, Jack. I don't know footy talk. Yeah, so f- number one draft head. pick, yeah. Melbourne. But it, but all that all that sort of stuff happened, and and so having the failure in my footy career was meant to be my you know it was meant to be my life, right? Mm. Um, it was a very public, big failure that affected my life, and completely changed it all by the age of twenty one, twenty two. So did you have to reframe? Were you? someone who had that relationship with failure or did you have to purely based on that? I never had that until that, yeah. that moment, mm. right? Until then. So young. Is it I was like 21, 22, I was like, shit, I was meant to be 35 at this point uh-huh. and I'm now 21 and what the hell am I going to do? And, but it, it, you know, that I kind of all sat, I mean, it was a very traumatic experience in my footy career, but it all, um, you got to be okay with the failure. And we mm-hmm. have failed many, many, many times in our business. And, I'm really cool with that. Mm. Like, and not who just, taught you that? Oh, uh, I don't know. But the the answer is probably mm. my family. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it just comes quite naturally to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I was um, I was listening to a podcast a few years ago because I, I always because I was sort of reflecting on this at the moment, and I thought maybe it's 
a bit screwy in the head because I can <laughs> fail and then like forget about it the next. Well, not forget about it, it's but a bit I'm like psychopathic. So yeah, I can be yeah. like, <laughs> "That happened. Whatever. Yeah. Move on. Yeah. Right. Burn Burn take what you need to learn <laughs> and get out." And I was listening to a thing with Richard Branson a few years ago, and he was talk- They were talking about all the virgin mm-hmm. stuff that they oh, had yeah. that failed. And uh, and he they asked him a question like, "Do you ever think about it?" He goes, "No." Nah. He goes, the second we, we decide, like the second that meeting happens, we decide, right, mm. we're shutting down virgin brides. Mm. He goes, I'll never think about it again. He goes, virgin forget- brides? I th- exactly. <laughs> 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 I think they sold. But it, so is that, is, that a, a, is that a building the muscle of being able to deal with failure or is it a muscle to be able to push failure to the side? You know, like is it is it building, is that actually resilience or is it, some kind of, um, you know, laser beam focus that it, nothing outside of my periphery doesn't matter. Uh, it's both. It's fairly as, as dismissive as I could potentially sound by saying it and, and, and whatever. It is hurtful in every way. Mm. Every time something fails, right, we went to London. Um, we had two good years in London. We had a, w- one year that was a, a, a bad year in London. Like it's painful. Right, and every time we've had a business that hasn't worked, there's there's this flow-on effect. People mm. lose their jobs. It's, 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 it is it is emotionally painful mm. and hurtful in every way possible. Right, and that's and uh, you know that can't be dismissed. At the same time, if you don't try and you don't open yourself up to that pain, mm. you'll never actually succeed because mm. we've had so many more successes mm. than we have failures. But the the failures that are maybe two, three, four significant ones, they're the ones that hurt. Mm. They're the ones that put lines on your face, right? They're the ones that really, you know, they put some, <laughs> put some heat on you in, in your, uh, in your heart, but they're the, also the, the baseline that allows mm. you to then build a, a bigger business. We're now in America. We've got 40 odd staff in America. We've got a good business over there. That's really going very mm. well. And we wouldn't have done that without the failure in the UK. Um, so you've got to be able to do that, but you've also got to be wired a bit that that you can just let it, mm-hmm. you can move past it. Because if you can't move past it and a lot of people don't, you'll never get back. Maybe there's something in failing big first when you're young because if you start failing small and then you start moving away because failure is failure, you feel shit about it. Mm-hmm. And so it's there could be a resilience in failing big, not saying go and bloody take out. Well, yeah, there's diminishing and- returns in regards to how sad you can feel. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going to feel sad on the small stuff, might as well go for the big stuff and feel equally as sad. Yeah, well, but- if, if we don't – yeah, that's the thing. It's like if we don't give it a mm-hmm. real red-hot crack, yeah. just failing – with a little, a little crack. Um, yeah, I definitely have. I've had a bunch of different businesses I st- and I still, I, I still don't think we've found the, the model or the thing. We're still working on our vision in ways that we, we, we almost know our, we know our vision, but we, we don't know yet how to get there with what we're doing. Because you've got short term and long term and sometimes there's short term opportunities that could create sort of a, sus- a sustainable business, mm. but it's not necessarily the exact business you want to create. But I was uh, on um, quitting because I was, th- I was thinking about like what it takes to like at what point do you quit and you were talking uh, on another podcast about the going into a room knowing that it was done and they were going to sort of let you go in the footy thing. I mean you had it, it's the classic case of like uh, am I going to quit or am I going to get fired have you built the resilience to quit or do you do you wait until you're backed into a corner? It's a good question. I would say uh, in business you have to quit early because mm-hmm. you can lose big. Um, but it's it's not so so you ha- you have to decide in in business because there's a whole you can't you can't uh, string people out because mm-hmm. there's other people involved generally mm-hmm. in business. So you can't string people out. You've got to do the right thing by them and generally the right thing by, by them is calling something early. Um, and then there is obviously the financial exposure as well. Yeah. If you let a thing well, just as soon keep as going. You're insolvent, you have to let yeah, them, yeah, 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 exactly. As soon as, as – if you keep letting the, yeah. you know, you're not going to make the decision, it might come good next <laughs> month or it might come good the month after and then mm-hmm. there's a bigger mm-hmm. and bigger hole. Um, and the ones where I've made bad decisions are the ones where I've tried to do the right – I've tried to be nice. 
And I've tried to be, uh, you know, oh, we'll keep that going. Oh, oh, the impact of that's too hard. And then, you know, ultimately the, you're trying to be trying to be nice is different from trying to do mm. the right thing. Is it? Have you moved away from uh, having a hard conversation in those times? Because I think I would probably go to the nice or the the thing that is a bit more comfy mm. yeah. than go fuck. I know I need to have this hard convo. But I just I, I hold off a little bit longer. <laughs> that's that's when I've done it badly. Yeah, yeah. When I've done it well, um, is have the hard conversation immediately straight away, and I, I'm kind of comfortable in that environment, um, being able to say that and give direct advice, whether it's to my friends or my work colleagues or staff or anyone. Um, very happy to give that you know direct advice to tell you, tell you my thoughts or, or whatever as it goes. So it's a it's a really important component mm. um, of doing that, and again. People, if, if, if you live your life by saying, I'm trying to do the right thing, and the right thing is distinctly different from being nice mm. because the right thing to individuals helps an individual get better. It helps an in- individual improve. It helps them learn in their life. People are just nice all the time. There's no challenge. There's mm. no growth. There's no evolution, and that 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 is what ultimately – provides a lack of leadership and it provides mm. a lack of direction and no one gets anything out of that. What about short-term versus long-term? So there could be the right thing to do now that could potentially be the wrong thing to do in the future. So, for instance, like businesses this time of year, cash flow, people stop, uh, you know, yep. d- doing work and all that sort of thing, trying to work out, like Tommy and I working out, how do we make sure that December and January looks good and into Feb while still maintaining our overarching vision of what we want 2020 to be? Well, it's it's a good question and a lot of people get caught up on the overarching vision. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you just got to do what you get to do, Yeah, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saying revenues light December and jam because everyone's away. We need to do a couple of things December and January that just allow us to get through this period and then we'll get back on track, mm-hmm. right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The amount of people I've seen businesses that fail because they want to stick so true to that vision and that direction they've gone, and yeah. then six months later they're out of business mm. because that vision or that direction didn't work. Like there's just there's just nothing. You can have the greatest idea in the world, but unless other people are going to buy it and they're mm. going to engage with it, it's not worth anything, right? Now, now you've got to offset that with you know the Henry Ford quote that if you ask people what they wanted. They'd say faster horses. horses. Yeah. They, they didn't know they wanted yeah, cars. Yeah. So you got to – same with, you know, the great creators of, of our time are those who have, who have led industries, mm. led product, led mm. people or led society into areas that the society didn't know they were, needed to be in. Mm. And the leader took them there. You know, Nelson Mandela was a great leader in taking a society where they needed to be, not where they were. And that's my that's my big knock on leadership generally mm-hmm. in in the world, whether that's in politics or whether that's in business, is there's so much polling done. I'm going to ask you what you want. I'm going to ask you what you want, and and I'm going to ask everyone what they want, and I'm going to then act on what they want. Now that's good to a certain extent, but you're the leader. Mm-hmm. The leader's job is to take a group that primarily is just trying to day to day just get through their lives and do what they do. You've been put in charge of business or society of whatever to be able to propel this thing forward. Great business leaders have vision and say, we are going here. Along the journey, we need to step off that path a little bit to ultimately get to where we need to get to, mm. but this is where we're going. Great political leaders do the same thing. We are taking this society from where we are today to where we need to be, not necessarily where everyone wants to go. And we've seen that time and time and time again. The civil rights movement's the same. We've, you know, we've mm. seen... We've seen those who have been afraid to act because of backlash mm. or because of their perceived, you know, in business, especially in the creative industry, you know, oh, we're selling out or we're doing those sort of things. Sometimes you've got to do what you need to mm. do mm. to get to ultimately where that vision is taking you and where you want to go. Uh, when you've got uh, all the sort of businesses within the business, is that how you see it with Bastion? Is everyone running their own yep. books or how does it, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so everyone's got their own entity. They yeah. run their own P&Ls. And, yeah. and, and so if you are having a meeting with one of the CEOs or whatever within that, that sort of area and they've got a cash flow problem, 
how are you entering in as a leader? Does it at that point are you talking very specific tactics around that? Okay, how do we make it work now? Or is that the time to pull out the strategy and go and circle? Uh, to answer that question, mm-hmm. there's some some specificity around around things like cash flow or mm-hmm. or um, people management sure. or any of these these operational things in business. So we meet with with the CEOs. I meet with the CEOs once a month. Jack deals with them on a day to day basis, um, helping them through all of those different issues mm-hmm. that come up in business and and all that different stuff. Um, there is also is also part of my job primarily to be able to pull out the strategy mm-hmm. when appropriate when we're going off course and saying, "Hang on, let's not get distracted over here. Let's stick with what we're doing because we know that works, and let's keep going." It's also my job to say, well, bang on the strategy, it all kind of works, is now the time to be able to do the next thing, mm. right? It's now the time to be able to just push it out a little bit more because we've built a good baseline to be able to create an opportunity for growth. Um, and that's that's one of the good things about our, our group and the structure of our group is that it puts us in a position where the CEOs and the business operators can operate on the day-to-day find the clients, deliver the work for the clients, look after the staff, execute each business's strategy. And then it's my job to say, right, how do we grow this thing by 100% year on year, not just 10%? And and it's that balance that is a constant push and pull of when's the right time to do all that stuff. So do you have shared services or are you, like is everyone invoicing each other for time? How does that work? Yeah, there's a bit of that. We have shared services like finance, HR, um, like people and cultural recruitment, that sort of mm-hmm. stuff, marketing, anything, anything that everyone uses. So there's a centralised service around that that everyone sort of chips into, and then um, uh, and then the, but everyone operates on their own accord, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then there is some in in invoicing to each other, mm-hmm. um, but we find the best way to make everyone or to get everyone working together is to have as little of that as possible. Sure. Why is that? Because you care more. Yeah. Because if I care about you, I'm more likely to help you. And mm-hmm. if you care about me, you're more likely to help me. And so creating a culture of people caring about each other and working as a team, that they generally give a shit about each mm-hmm. other, then you are in a better position to be able to ha- have a better working relationship. If I'm only helping you because I'm going to get a kickback from the work you win, mm-hmm. it's it's hollow. So, so for new businesses starting out, they've focused so hard on the vision to get it to a point where it's actually working. Once you get it to a point where it's working, is it a matter of like, have you guys found you're like, we're bunkering down now because we've got something that works versus spending too much time on achieving a greater thing or expanding? Yeah, there's, there's a combination of that stuff. So businesses, like for me, I, I am most comfortable when I'm starting new businesses, doing new things, creating new stuff, coming up with a new idea. Mm. To, you know, that's my sweet spot. Now, we got to a point three years ago where that wasn't good anymore, right, because I used to do a different thing every second week, right? It was always a joke in the company that I'd come in and all of a sudden I got some other idea and we're going and doing that. Now, that <laughs> got us to where it got us to about three years ago. Mm. Then I kept going for another two years yeah. and made a shitload of mistakes yeah. and put a heap of pressure on the company, um, sucked a lot of cash out of the business, put a lot of resource pressure on the business uh, because I was going, well, this has worked for five, six years. Mm. I'll just keep doing it. And just not that's just not how it works because just because it's worked for five or six years doesn't mean it's going to work for the next five or six years. So my greatest discipline now in what I do is do less. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life mm. is with a business now with 250 staff across two countries, um, you know, our our growth in Australia and how we're going to get, not just our growth, but how we're going to get fundamentally better at what we do is by more consistently doing the work we already do with the people that do mm. it. Is that a, com- a shift mm. from the original? Because I guess like from an outsider's perspective, you guys are building the mega agency sort of thing. And so you start the business, you're acquiring, you're building the mega agency. Is it a bit of a change of heart saying, oh, fuck, like let's stop mm. acquiring it and is, let's just work? It is It is for me. Mm-hmm. Jack loves it. 
Yeah. Right? Because Jack's wired differently. Because Jack just he he wants to run the business, mm-hmm. right? Do the work, work with work with the, the CEOs, um, create an environment that's that is conducive to creating the best creative output and executing the best work. He just wants to get access to more clients, you know, be able to provide a better integrated solution. That's what he does. I want to go and acquire 10 more agencies and bolt yeah. them in and, mm-hmm. you know, turn the thing into this behemoth. Now, so he was he, he always over the years that we worked doing more and more and more, he was always like, yeah, um, okay, do you think maybe we should just chill out for a moment now? And, uh, and so – this sits really well with him now, mm. right? It it sits fine with me because it's what's needed to be done, but it's not it's not natural in my personality. Is it a holding back on being creative? Because I can no. imagine the guy's creative who's coming up with all these business ideas and wanting to go and do this, that, and the other. Yeah, it's it's holding back on the on the entrepreneurial thing to do something different. Mm. You know what. I'm like, should we start a strategic consulting firm? Mm. Should we have a legal department? Yeah. Like, should we be selling? Or should we have a law firm? Like, you know, I'm saying, well, why can't professional services expand into all professional services? Yeah. Should we have an accounting firm? You're going right? to be GE by the end of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right. That's that's where I think. Yeah. And then, and over that two year period where I say I put a lot of pressure on the business was because, you know, I'm thinking like, right, more. What else yeah. can we do? And the reality is just the business just wasn't. It was fine when we were mm-hmm. small, but it's it's not when you're bigger. And so, so why is that? What is, what hap- what happens when you get bigger? Uh, it, it, it's it is a little bit more. It's a bit harder to be nimble, mm-hmm. right? Not not like well, it's slow. We can mm-hmm. change things on a dime, yeah. um, but it's a little bit. You got more. Um, there's a lot more people involved, mm-hmm. so. You can't just start a legal firm like we used to and just have one going and uh-huh. that'll be fine. It'll, it'll work or it won't. Are they siloed financially though that it is? Because I can see the excitement and it's like, well, fuck, start a law firm. If it doesn't work, it shits the bed and that just falls off. But then it, yeah. in <laughs> theory, yes, it could yeah. all work fine. Uh-huh. But it puts more pressure on their finance department because mm-hmm. they've got to raise invoices, yeah. right, and they've got to engage with their finance. You know, like, it, it puts more pressure on an HR department because they've got to contract these staff now and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Eight years ago, we didn't have contracts, right? We didn't have any of that sort of stuff. We're just yeah. like it was different, right? Um, and so there's just there's just a, a reality. And and also when you look at it from a, a business perspective, you say, well, where are we going to get bigger, bigger and better growth? Mm-hmm. Is it through starting a law firm that's going to take four or five years to really get going and is not really part of what we do? And is there any synergies in being a cross-sell clients and all those questions? Or is it just continue to get better at what we do currently and are we going to get better ex- exponential growth out of that? The answer is stick to your knitting and do what you do currently, mm-hmm. right? There wasn't the answer seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Seven years ago the answer was do more, get more stuff in the pipe because then we can create something that is unique and we've done that. In America, um, you know, we've got three agencies in America so it's a combination of both, Right. And I'm not living over in America. I'm not the one driving it. Dax, our CEO over there, he's leading the strategies, doing it his way. He's an old military man. He's an F-16 fighter pilot. He's he wants to, you know he's he's a lot more like Stony. Create a strategy straight up and down. Get go and get it done. Um, and so we do it that way because it works. Mm. The the US market versus the Australian market. I guess a lot of the time we can look at Australia and say we're fucking tiny. And uh, I guess even looking at the the model that you're doing, there's not like I don't really know of anyone in Australia doing it in a significant way. What was the reality check arriving to the US or even London? US is the US is a fascinating market. I love it. We lived over there for well, we stayed over there for three months, my wife and my little baby boy and, and I um a little while ago as we we're getting it, getting it going. And I love the American market. We're based in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. There's mm. It's a great place. Horrible weather. <laughs> well, they actually had rain. I Did saw they? like a week oh, ago. That's yeah. sad. I was <laughs> I was over there a few weeks ago, and it was beautiful. I landed from New York. New York yeah. was negative three degrees. Right, absolutely deplorable. I get on the plane, land land in LA. I get in there, sunshine. It's yeah. thirty two degrees. Like, is it Orange great. County that you're? But we're about. To, We've got there? two offices. Yeah. We got we got one in Irvine, which mm-hmm. is in Orange County. We got yeah. another in Highland Park, which mm-hmm. is downtown LA. Yeah. 
And I, I get in there and I said to uh, the woman that runs our research firm, I said, geez, I love coming to LA. Like the weather's beautiful. She goes, oh, tomorrow, it's not great tomorrow. I said, but what? She goes, oh, it's not great tomorrow. It's 24 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not great. Right? Um, but, yeah, the US, the US market is massive. If we had created the same business, if we were American, mm-hmm. creating the same business in America in exactly the same way, same story, it's three times the size, right? Mm-hmm. Budgets are bigger, brands are bigger, population size is bigger, all that sort of stuff. Talent here. Mm-hmm. is exceptional. Talent in Australia, um, not the t- talent in America is exceptional as what well. What about but work ethic? Because I always feel like in the US, like bums on seats, longer hours, all that sort of thing. Different is rules. Yeah. They, they don't have the annual leave rules. Mm-hmm. They, it's, it's a, it's a, different, it's yeah. a different way of operating. Mm-hmm. Um, I, don't, I don't see a massive difference in work ethic or people wanting to be engaged or, mm-hmm. or any of that sort of stuff. Um, I don't really see a huge difference in the way anyone operates, to be honest. I think the talent over there is good. I think the talent over here is very is, is good. I was on an equal path. Um, it's not like the US talent is miles ahead of the Australian talent mm. or anything like that. Mm. Australian talent is top end, right? Um, the way Australian businesses operate is top end. And um, the only difference is in America, they're talking about, you know, Businesses that you've never heard of that are that are yeah. small to medium sized companies that are still four hundred million dollar businesses, yeah. mm. right? With huge marketing budgets. Here, you, you deal with your top tier, and yeah. there's a big gap. The right? pie is so much bigger over there. And that's in the every thing. regard. Yeah, yeah. And that's <laughs> <a> serving size. <laughs> Everything. That's the thing that makes a difference. I spend two weeks there every eight weeks. Have you been to Cheesecake Factory? You know what I have. Yeah, it, yeah I mean, it's nothing mm. to really. So no, no, I just think it was just like size wise. Oh, yeah, so you like get significant. Ones. So when you when you <laughs> just moving straight on, <laughs> <laughs> we went there that for just ninety seven's birthday. Yeah, we went there for ninety seven. But I'd watched Game Changers had gone uh, vegetarian yeah. for like all the time that we and were there. The cheesecake factory. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but they couldn't do my favorite like grande burrito veggio. So yeah. I had to. It came have, out. What there was a burrito that, this long. Yeah, you know, I think at the cheesecake factory, one of their marketing initiatives is their menu, and I. I think, uh, um, this is not fact, yeah. but I, I think if I recall a conference I was at, they've got some exorbitant amount of chicken dishes <laughs> on really? there. Yeah, like, yeah, like, it's, like right. it's 100 chicken dishes or something. Like it's a huge <laughs> amount of chicken dishes um, that's on their menu and it's a big part of their attraction. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you leaned into the <laughs> Cheesecake Factory. It's time you moved to something. Uh, which Cheesecake Factory? We're going to stay on it. <laughs> we went to the one on 3rd in Santa Monica. That was quite good. That's quite yeah, a good. That's right. Rooftop bar. I went to the one in Pasadena. Yeah, well, we've got to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you go over, say you you acquired these new businesses, what's you, what's your role as a chairman of the business coming into uh, these new? They're already established, mm. and you're sort of rebranding or mm-hmm. putting your stamp on them. What's the day to day look like? For a, coming into a business that already exists. And was that with the US? Was it an existing com- company that you put sort of the Bastion logos uh, on? The answer to that question is we started with um, just Dax mm-hmm. over there. Yeah. And then his room was to go find these agencies. Okay, sure. And we acquired the agencies. Mm-hmm. Um, the day to day for those. For coming in to go for, as, a, you know, the founder of a company. So when it gets to this level, it's a mm-hmm. different sort of activity that you have to engage with Man, each day. Okay. Yeah. So for you um, personally. Okay. For me personally, it's different. So I used to find every acquisition. I used to do every deal. I used to lead the integration and, and all that. Now uh, I don't really do any of that. Now DAX, so we won't make any more acquisitions in the Australian market um, in the for the foreseeable future. In the US market – um, Dax is out there finding the acquisitions. When he's got one that says, yep, we're exchanging financials, we're looking at putting a deal together, he likes the guy, all that sort of stuff, I go over there, I meet them, um, I basically I give the tick of approval on the deal, all right, and I, this kind of, my kind of mm. skill is being able to put a deal together fairly well. So I kind of get – we have a baseline deal that we operate on, but then I kind of get in with a bit of the creativity on the deal. So I help with that. Um, I help – I kind of give the tick of approval that they're the right kind of person mm. and all that sort of stuff. Are you basing it on the values of the Australian operation? And- no, I'm basing it on the values of the – I know what's worked here, but what works here doesn't actually work mm. there, right? So basing it on the values of that, how they work together, it's, ba- it's good to have a, 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 an external – 
a, a half external person because um, Dax is driving every day, day in, day out, meeting these guys, finding them, and he wants to get them done. So I have to have the discipline to be able to be at arm's length of that and go, I know you want to get that done, but he's not the mm. right guy. Is you it know? the old you, like uh, the the one that wanted to expand? Is that is that what you see in Well, it, it's a, a bit like that, mm. but it's also the same as if, if any business, you know, like – Every time we hire an individual, a, a staff member into the into the company, you know, if you're the general manager of one of our businesses and you need, you know, two more staff members, for the period that you don't have those staff members, you're hugely overworked, yes. right? It's stressful, it's painful, it, it, it's horrible. So half the time you get to the point where it's like anyone will do, mm. right? Because my life's unbearable at the moment because I'm doing the job of three people. So anyone will do. Now, it gives you like two weeks of of relief and then after that it's even more painful because yeah. then you realise they're not right for the job yeah, and yeah. all that sort of stuff. So we always make sure we've got some objective view of people that um, aren't involved or aren't impacted by whether you hire that person or not to be able to go. So less emotional or less trying to fix their less mm, yeah, short-term yeah, problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that's the same same in the US, right? So, um, so if Dax is out there doing it, he wants to build his business, right? He wants to go from 40 staff to 70 staff and, and be able to kind of grow the thing and, and do what he does, which I absolutely want to do as well and we're absolutely aligned in that. Um, at the end of the day, I'm me and my family, we take the risk on the money. Mm-hmm. So so if there's that objective view to say, mm, you know, every time we do one, if we get it wrong, we get it really wrong now because yeah. it's not yeah. small stuff, right? Like yeah, it's yeah. bigger stuff now. Um, and so no more cheesecake factory. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a big that's a big crossover. In, yeah. In that what's what's the deal with profit with these types of things? Like at this stage of your business, when you're bringing in these other companies, like how far along before you actually see dividends and all that sort of thing w- within a within a business? For us, it's it, for us it's different because um, it takes us three or four years to get a return out of mm-hmm. any acquisition. So we don't see anything out of probably three or four years. Mm. Um, the but we have a we have a policy with our subsidiary the, the guy or the mm-hmm. person that the, that we acquired the business from. We acquire eighty percent of the business generally, um, and then they get a dividend distribution. So service businesses should be profitable from day one. Mm-hmm. There should be no no lack of profitability because, as I said, there's no capital major capital expense. Mm. That'll stop that that profitability. So they sh- they should be profitable. Agency should run pro- profit should never be shied away from. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a lot of in a lot of business, especially service business, people don't like to talk about money. They don't like to talk about profit like it's a like it's a bad thing. What do you think it is? Why do you think that is? Uh, I think it's a lack of education around how business works. Um, business owners don't mind talking about that, but a, a vast majority of everyone else really kind of struggle to to talk about that. The reality is, if a business doesn't make profit, then your then the, the staff's livelihoods are in jeopardy, um, and everyone's you know the reality is with two hundred and fifty odd employees, we pay a lot of mortgages, we feed a lot of kids, we turn a lot of lights on, and that is a huge responsibility that that we as the major shareholders own in the company, right? And that is a it's a huge thing that sits on my shoulders and our shoulders. Every day, and it's not something we take lightly. That if I employ you, that's a commitment I've made to you that I'm going to mm. keep paying your wage, and so you can then feed your kids and you can pay your rent and you can do whatever else you need to do. And in turn, you'll deliver the work. If we're not running a profitable business, we don't have the discipline around that, your job's in jeopardy, which means your family's in jeopardy, which means mm. you know, you, you, if you lose your job, you, then you got rent issues, you got, you know, putting food on the table, all the other mm. stuff that goes with that. So it's just a reality of life. You just need – businesses need to be profitable if they're not effective or running there. Um, and so it should never run away from it. The complexities of this style of structure, does it, does it require extra levels of consideration around taxation and all that sort of stuff or is it fairly easy? Uh, the honest answer is you're going to have to ask your CFO. <laughs> um, but the, the the very layman answer is not too much. Mm-hmm. You, you get you get hit with um, with a bigger business, you get sort of some larger employment tax and some mm-hmm. other stuff like that. Um, but we run consolidated books um, or we run consolidated cash flows and things mm-hmm. like that. It helps a bit. Um, it becomes a 
bit more painful at the end of the year because we've mm. got to run 15 tax returns and all that sort of stuff. So our mm. finance department gets hit a bit with a multiple uh, entity structure. Um, but it's not it's not too mm. bad. Our yeah. CFO will tell you that, you know, it's come tax time, it's a real pain in the ass, which it is. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, it also allows us to, to engage with all of our mm. different subsidiary shareholders in, in a pretty unique way. You talk about people shying away from making money, think that people can have a bit of a complex when it comes to sales and generating sales and finding leads. What's your perspective on yeah. that? Yeah, I, I can't, can't, still can't get my head around that mm. because they do. The amount of people that say, yeah, I, mm, I don't sell. <laughs> I don't sell. Okay. <laughs> really? Well, you, you know, then you are, you are limited in your career. Mm. Like unless you are a creative and you're purely a creative or you're, you know, you're a very specialist um, person of which there's not many of them, you're limited. If, if you can't grow a client and, and find a way to cre- solve clients' problems, which is all it is, selling is not. Is it the reframing? Is people Are people looking at sales the wrong way? Yeah, it's like they're trying to sell you. If I'm trying to sell you this glass, mm-hmm. right, and you don't want the glass because mm-hmm. you've got a glass, then it's annoying. If you're thirsty, yeah. I'm trying to sell you a glass mm-hmm. and water. Yeah. Well, I'm providing you a service, mm-hmm. right? And that's the way it works. If you're, if you're a, um, you know, the the cliche used car salesman. If you're a used car salesman trying to sell them a car that doesn't work to someone that doesn't really need a car, then yeah, you're a slime ball, right? Yeah. That's no good. If you're selling a car that works for a good price to someone that doesn't have a car who mm. needs a car, well, you you are making their life better. Right? So, is it the people that don't that say I don't sell? They're not clear on the value that they personally bring to yeah, the equation. They're, they're not clear on that, and then they're not clear on the baseline of what we act, we or the business, any business, actually does. Right? Like, um, the the our <laughs> Our clients engage us because they need the work done, right? They need to sell. They need to sell more cars, more soft drink, more uh, beer, more whatever. Um, so they engage us to to market their wares so they can sell more service. And they engage a number of agencies to do a number of things. Now, if they can get it in, streamlined in one place, they can get better work, and we can provide a solution that sells more of their product. That's what they want. So why would we hold back? We're actually doing a disservice. If I know that I can provide a service to you that is of value that can potentially provide you with more sales, but I don't tell you about it because I'm scared of the sell, I'm doing you a disservice, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that that's and that is what business is. Business is not created out of people that don't want anything. Business is created. These microphones that we're talking on, mm-hmm. you know, or the new iPhone that I'm getting today that I'm all excited about that Which cost me you getting thousand dollars. Uh, the e- e- XS. Okay, yeah. It's not the brand new one. Okay, it's a no, different one. No, that's okay. He got the new one. Yeah, I got the new. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So I got right. the wide angle. Yeah. With, with, with yeah, the three yeah, camera yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't got a case for it yet. But. I've had a whole thing about my phone recently. Yeah, yeah it's great. Right. If, He's going to now want that. It okay. feels nice, look, does it? For those on the camera, look how excited he is. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's he so excited it. by this, yeah. right? For those listening, he's got a big grin on his face. He's really excited. Now, if the sales guy didn't sell you the right phone, didn't you know get this on you, you wouldn't. Well, I, s- feel, I right? saw the value give me back my phone. Um, the- <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the value is in like I'm like, oh, I've got a better camera so I can be a better creator. Exactly. So I've, I've yeah. created the story. And that's, it. that's that's what it is. It's mm. like that's, that's what business is. Business mm. is about creating a product or a service that can enhance someone else's life. And that in B2B, that someone else is the CEO, the mm. marketing director, the staff of that company that ultimately if that, car company, whoever sells more cars, then that's better for everyone. Mm-hmm. So we provide a service that betters them. If it's phones, then they provide a service where you you can now operate the way you operate on your phone and mm-hmm. you're ex- the beautiful thing that Apple has done is you've created, it's a pretty fashion accessory, yeah. right? You're super juiced about mm-hmm. it um, that that you've cr- got this fashion mm-hmm. accessory. Um, that that's what business is. And anyone that shies away from that thinks they're just there to do the work they're asked to do doesn't understand what, how business is created. Mm. So, um, for smaller operations that, you know, set out to create a business, they think they want to build the brand, but in essence, 
what that brand is, is essentially their service and more specifically to service-based businesses, less products. So a lot of young people starting a video production company, it's really just them, Mm -hmm. right? For the early Mm -hmm. days. What was the distinction with you guys in those early days where you actually saw it as a brand play or were you even thinking build the brand? It's less personally to me. We didn't think that for years. So we had separate brands and um, we wanted everyone to work together because uh, it's a story we don't have time for here, but there was a distinct moment where we put three agencies together, they pitched on work and they won it and like it was like, well, that works, right? Mm-hmm. So that was kind of it. And then and we didn't rebrand a Bastion Collective where everything had a unified brand and we had the, you know, all the way it works. Not long ago, mm-hmm. four years ago maybe, like, if that, like, it, it was really, um, we we really didn't push that because we didn't really understand it. We didn't, uh, which is weird coming from a brand and marketing company, uh, but we we because I think most hold most holding companies in the marketing space they do run independent brands. Mm. So we thought, well, everyone can run their own independent brand. But the minute we stopped doing that, that was the minute where we thought, well. We're actually unique in what we do now in our ability to provide a single brand integrated service. Well, you have to be in the market to understand where you fit to then evolve yeah. and to do all that That's sort of right. thing. That's right. It was an evolution. Yeah. And, we, you know, we, 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 for a long time, I'd like to think we're out of the kid stage now, but for a long time we were kids just yeah. trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, now I think I think vaguely we know what we're doing, but um, <laughs> we, were, we were figuring out what is the best way. And there's one of the things about our business that, I think it's been one of our strengths is we're not settled with any legacy issue ever. I, I'm not, I, you know, if I had worked in the holding companies or, or in a marketing services world for a decade and then left and started my own business, I would have an opinion on what, how the market operates, what it's missing and what I should create to fill that void. I was 22, barely had a job before, so I didn't know any of that. Yeah. So I just cre- we just created whatever the client wanted. Mm-hmm. And so the client said, Can you guys do that? We then, we never went, yeah, we can do that. Because half the time we didn't even know what it was, mm-hmm. right? So then we'd go, shit, all right, leave that one with us. We go and ask them, well, how do we do that? We find someone who's an expert in doing that. And we'd say, right, we can't do it. But we pulled them in and they can deliver it. And and so we, we everything we created was about creating exactly for what the client want and evolving that without any of the bullshit or any mm-hmm. of the red tape that goes with it. Um, and that's been a revolution. I love how open you are to talk about this stuff because I think that some people don't go there and they sort of hold their cards close. Mm. But I think uh, sharing all of this is going to help so many people. I know that specifically I've got people in my mind that would mm. absolutely love what you've spoken about today. Do you know, it's funny because I never used to have any problems saying anything when I was mm. when we, the business was smaller and we, we didn't have anything to lose, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, I was, I was talking about someone about this the other day because I did an interview and um, they said something similar. And always in the back of my mind now as I'm talking, I'm like, shit, should I be saying this? Is this too open or is this? Is it? And then quickly I go, well, it's just the truth. So yeah. well, I'm not going yeah, like, yeah, yeah. to It's your operating. You can tell it's your operating system, it, right? It just, yeah. it just is what it is, yeah. right? It's the truth. Mm. So it, it, but the bigger you get and the more you've got to lose, the more scared you are of failing, which mm-hmm. means the more kind of barriers you put up around mm-hmm. yourself. And uh, and then you become less authentic and you become dull, mm. you know. And and I suppose your listeners might be the uh, the judge of this on the dull factor, but <laughs> um, but he, uh, you know, it's I just think it you lose you lose a bit of your soul if mm. you're constantly guarded about what you say. This mm. is it, warts and all. We'll tell you anything you want to know because we've had some good times, we've had some bad times, and we've had more good times than we had bad mm. times, and. Reality is we've built a business, the largest independent in the country, and we're building a business in America, and we're doing some good stuff, mm-hmm. right? And we're only doing that because we've been able to attract brilliant people into our organisation that can create something that is significantly mm-hmm. um, better than anything I or Jack could have created by yeah. ourselves at all. I think we're beyond the time of showing just the polished you know, mm-hmm. well executed version. It's the learnings that come from all of the mistakes, and that's the only way you get there. Well, if you do that, if you if you show everything as shiny when it's not necessarily shiny, mm. then when you actually do have wins, you can't properly celebrate them because you've been communicating it the whole time. Just quickly, because I know what about on a personal level? I think when someone asks you how you're going, you say, "Yeah, I'm great." Mm. 
I probably say that when I'm not doing mm. great. And it's a thing that it's like, it's almost like to stop that interaction or it's just what culturally yeah. everyone does. It's, uh, I, I agree. It's that my wife always, she says to me every day, how are you? Stop asking me that. Like <laughs> it's this, you know, and she's like, I'm genuinely interested. And I'm like, you are not. You're like, <laughs> you know, you're just, it's just this, it's this habit. thing, yeah. this habit that yeah. comes off the, off yeah. the tongue. Right. And, uh, and it's yeah. Hey, how are you? Good, mm. great. Oh, let's let's get into what we're actually talking about. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's the it's the crutch question. But yeah. how do you personally, someone who has a lot of responsibility, how do you face that when you're not feeling great? Yeah. Well, I lie a lot. <laughs> I think good answer. Answer. Thanks. I think yeah. Good thanks. Yeah, I think you go. Yeah, I'm great. I'm flying. You know, yeah. when you're potentially not, because. You'd love to be honest the mm. whole time. And to my friends and other people, I, yeah. I am honest. But, you know, for anyone I'm just on a, in a off conversation with. But um, it's difficult. It's difficult. What do you say? I'm really battling, mate, actually. Yeah. But yeah. Then I mean, those people need, I guess, like when someone says, how are you, what are they seeking as well? Because I think that's the, the interesting yeah. thing, which is mm. like if, like it's because sometimes I get caught, you know, you, the off occasion, I feel like, you know, one every 10 years, you do a how are you or whatever and it's to like the person who's working at the checkout or whatever and they tell you their life story and yeah. you're like, oh, fuck. Exactly. You know? yeah. and so, it's exactly right because if yeah. you go, they go, how are you? And you go, yeah. oh, man, I'm yeah. oh, geez, yeah. battling out a fight with the missus. Yeah. Or, oh, shit. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck, really? Okay. <laughs> Are we talking about yeah. that for the next 15 minutes? Yeah. Like that, that's, and that, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. That's why, you know, hopefully um, everyone in their lives has got some really good, friends around them. I've been very blessed that I've got great friends. I've got a great family. I've got an amazing wife and uh, and, and a, a young son. And I've got a great support network around me of people that I can be honest with and I can be very true with mm. um, and share things. Because as a business owner, anyone out there that's a business owner knows that it's not always great, mm. you know, and and so you, you go through that and you need those great people around you. I've been very blessed that I do have those people mm. around me. Um, and, uh, and so most of the time I can just, uh, yeah, man, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> well, next year, let's, uh, let's do another episode from the cheesecake factory. Yeah. yeah Business yeah. and burritos. I like that. <laughs> That'd yeah. be fun. A little, oh yeah, we'll probably be back over in LA. Yeah. End of the year or something. Anyway, Fergus, thanks so much for being on the show. Guys, cheers. Uh, it's a daily talk show. Hi at the daily talk show.com is the email address. If you enjoyed the show, leave us a five-star review on Apple podcasts. Otherwise we'll see you tomorrow. See you guys.